um, up out on the uh, revised cycle assessment, starting with where are we? I've got the final draft of the revised uh, life cycle assessment in my possession. I'll be reviewing that on uh, Sunday and Monday, Monday being a public holiday, and then I can return that back to Prof Vosloo. And then it goes on to Qantas in Switzerland, who are nationally accredited to um, review life cycle assessments and, and accredited as meeting the, in, the international standards for a study of that sort. And then during my presentation, I'll then come back as to why there's been about an eight or nine month delay and what were the lessons that we have learned from that. In terms of the socio-economic life cycle assessment, the social aspect of that was absolutely brilliant and is a world benchmark standard. And the economic part has stumbled behind, I think the uh, consultants we employed uh, didn't quite uh, grasp what was required. But at the technical meeting in May, chaired by Nico Mini, there are a couple of thoughts that we've got whereby we could probably complete that, uh, the economic aspects of that. And again, within about six to eight weeks, we should have enough material to start preparing for the roadshow. All right, what is a life cycle assessment? It's a tool for the systematic evaluation of the environmental impact associated with all the stages of a product's life from cradle to grey. And from that point of view, it's the overall impact on people, the environment, social structures, and the climate and climate change. And so you see it, it then goes all the way through from extracting the raw material, the manufacture, uh, the transportation, uh, and uh, the operating of the product, and then the, the demolition and, and recycling of, of the product at the end. And they're really a, a, a three-step and four-step process where you've got the goal and the scope definition, you've got the inventory analysis, the impact assessment, and then the interpretation of each of those stages as you go through. You really start with the energy and the materials and the questionnaires which were completed by ATCBA members in June, July 2013. And then you've got the emissions, the current value of the fuels, the transport energy, the operational energy, uh, which is derived from the thermal performance modeling and then international database sources for uh, the impact assessment. So again, it's a whole phase one, which is mining and manufacture, cradle to the gate, which is where the part that I'll concentrate quite a lot on. Phase two is gate to completed construction. Phase three is the operation. And in the LCA, it was assumed from international norms, and I think Andy Smith will talk a little bit more about that, but the assumption was that, that a building has an operational life of 50 years. And so that's the part that we will go on but Then phase four is demolition and recycling. Phase one, cradle to gate, is the mining of the clay to the stockpile, the stockpile to the plant, the crushing and the mixing, extrusion, drying, firing and the storage in the yard. And really this part of the phase is what we as brickmakers are most used to, which is the total diesel that is used over a year, the total kilowatt hours that is consumed in your factory, the internal body fuel and the external firing fuel equals the specific energy consumption, uh, SEC, which is megajoules per kilogram, which is the result that we as brickmakers are used to. And I think we need to keep that in our mind. Right. Process flow was a brickmaker's questionnaire, which we all filled in. This was the raw data, which was utilized by the University of Pretoria. Then the University of Pretoria LCA team input, they inputted over 6,000 individual items of data into um, a spreadsheet that was de developed by the researchers and the University of Pretoria's um, statistics department. The output from that then went into an international model called SEMA Pro, uh, which takes the data as brickmakers that we understand and then says what is the lifetime impact of each of those emissions that come out of the brickmaking process. And it uses a word that is only mentioned once or twice called characterization factors. So a kilogram of carbon dioxide is generated at the brickmaking plant today. 
actually doesn't just go away. It hangs around with a half uh, life cycle of 50 years. So it's continually damaging the environment. In terms of a gigajoule of energy, a fair amount of that gigajoule of energy goes into the chemical processes of bonding the brick together, but there is still energy heading out into the environment. And that hangs around for 10 years. I and mean, in terms of thermodynamics, it doesn't ever get lost, but it still creates climate change and damage in the environment. And that means that the energy that we um, compute as brickmakers is then multiplied up by certain factors to create what is called a life cycle impact of the total system. And the SEMA Pro software um, uses uh, impact 2002 plus characterization factors and that is dictated to by Qantas as I say an accredited um, agent for um, accrediting LCOs um, and that they, they then insisted that the impact 2000 plus was then utilized in this. Now wh where do the problems come in here? Where do the errors? Firstly um, in terms of the brick makers questionnaire one or two of those questions were not completely explicit as to the units that were required and so a number of us as brick makers interpreted in our own way and there were some errors there but that magnitude of that would have been one to one and a half percent on the total study. The second was were, was the input from the questionnaires translated or, or inputted correctly by the University of Pretoria team. Out of the 6,000 individual data items the UP got two wrong. So that is negligible. When it came to the, the data spreadsheet, uh, once I eventually got hold of that from about the 14th of December, there's a whole lot of formula that are embedded in the data sheet. And the formula contained incorrectly the fired mass of the brick, which is between 2.4 and 3 kilograms, which then overstated the energy in carbon dioxide by 2.4 to 3 times. And that was a University of Pretoria error, which is they've finally acknowledged and they've corrected it. So what I have ready to review is that factor has all been corrected. So what we've got is specific energy consumptions, um, which more accurately reflect what we as brickmakers. But as I said, the final report will still have the characterization factor of the long-term impacts so that will overstate from where we're sitting as brickmakers what is the megajoules per kilogram. Now the next part of the pro process flow is the impact categories are carcinogens, non-carcinogens, respiratory inorganics, ionizing radiation, ozone layer depletion, aquatic and terrestrial toxicity, terrestrial acidification and nitrification, land occupation, and really it's global warming and non-renewable energy which we are mainly concerned with global warming as carbon dioxide emissions, uh, CO2 kilograms per kilogram of fire work, non-renewable energy being the megajoules per kilogram. But all of the rest came out of your, the data that you provided in your questionnaire. How much sulfur dioxide, how much water do you use, what is your land usage, and all of these are then calculated in the SEMA Pro software to generate these categories. And the overview is the impact on human health, ecosystem quality, climate change, and the resources. Now the energy consumption comparisons that I've got here um, I drew from A, the LCA report and other reports which I accessed which said that in Canada in 1998 the average from the tunnel kilns was 4.6. Now how that figure came about I've, I've no idea. Um, that was very inefficient. Australia an average industry average of 3.4 and the UK Carbon Trust did a study in 2011 2012 of 173 uh, brickmakers using gas fired tunnel kilns in the UK. They came up with a figure of 2.54. And then there's a report from the University of Cape Town done in the mid 90s for the brickmakers. And I've just extracted the clamp and the tunnel kilns. And you can see there that it was 2.9, uh, 3.9 and then 2.93 with an industry average of 3.42. And then through the kind of permission of around about 35 of the CBA members late last year, I got access to the individual questionnaires 
and I calculated out from a brick maker what was the average of the clamp kilns in that questionnaire, and that was about 3.48, and the tunnel kilns are 2.74. But this is the brick maker's calculation. It hasn't got the characterization factor. The last figure at the bottom there, the industry average of 3.23, I've taken from the revised um, LCA report. And so therefore that is slightly higher than the figure that John Falstein um, has, has presented because it has a, this characterization long-term impact um, which is coming on it. And so you've got to be careful when you look at these figures that you're comparing apples with apples. And we have asked Prof. Foslu and, and uh, Greg Rao, so when the final LCA report is published, they in fact will then prepare what I call a brickmaker's annex year. And it will take the output from the University of Pretoria um, spreadsheet before it goes into all this black box calculation. And that's the, the spreadsheet that we, or the um, output that we would use as brickmakers. And then moving forward, um, I've been able to, oh, I can just take both graphs, no, no, that's cool, is indicate what happens as you change your production capacity. And it's not surprising that obviously when you produce at high volumes, you are more energy efficient than if you're producing at low volumes. And your tunnel kilns will tend obviously to be more efficient than tank kilns. Now this graph needs to be taken as work in progress. It can't be used as a, uh, an absolute tool for, for us as brick makers. But it's interesting that the clamp kiln graph closely correlates with the UK Carbon Trust study on 173 tunnel kilns, oh, sorry, the tunnel, the tunnel kiln closely correlates with their study on 173, and that the most efficient kilns are around about 1.2, 1.4 megajoules per kilogram, and then as you reduce um, your production rate, you're then getting up to 4 to 4.5 megajoules per kilogram. And it, the, 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 the point of inflection is when you're producing roughly below 20 million bricks a year. That's where your kilns become extremely um, inefficient. Now, if you look at the non-renewable energy consumption, the cradle to gate works out at roughly um, 715 megajoules for a square meter of brick walling. And I've used double leaf solid wall, uninsulated cavity, and insulated cavity. So, of course, when you do that, it's all the same, 715. Transporting from gate to site on average is 15 megajoules per square meter. And then materials to construct a square meter, it moves slightly from 318 to 320 to 323 as you start adding insulation and wall tiles and all those sort of things. Then in terms of operating and the thermal performance, that's where the real numbers come in over 50 years. This is 25,400 for a double leaf wall, 22,000 for uninsulated cavity, and 18,000. So the real energy consumption comes about in the operational part of the building and in terms of how do you build it as you insulate it and, and what climates are only working. And then demolition and recycling is a minor 59 megajoules per square meter. So even, even if a alternative building uh, material came along with zero you know, and it's got the same thermal mass and insulation properties as brick, it's, it is what is the nature of your building and where are you using it that actually counts. Okay. That's just a bar chart of, of what I've just spoken about. Oh, Eurocode 6, just a brief update. Eurocode 6 is a structural design uh, standard for masonry structures which has been adopted by uh, EU and as Britain is part of the EU. Hopefully it stays that way, in my opinion. Um, and the, the reason that we, we are looking at it is it is an up-to-date design code that is supported by current research both in the UK and in Europe. And our existing codes, SANS 10249, adopted in 1993, SANS 10145, concrete masonry was, was 1978. So we're, we're way out of date in terms of um, structural design codes. And it is believed by structural engineers this is inhibiting the design of uh, masonry structures, both clay and concrete, uh, particularly in regard to social housing in one respect, which is double-story, three-story. And therefore there is a, um, 
a motivation for us as, as, as CBA members to move forward so that our product can be used in more innovative ways to compete against alternative building technologies. And the Eurocode 6 is comprised of um, three uh, separate codes, rules for reinforced and unreinforced masonry, selection of materials and execution of masonry, and sim simplified calculation methods for unreinforced masonry. And there's a fourth one which is related to fire resistance. Now, the status at the moment, uh, a, one of the technical committees has recommended the adoption of Eurocode 6. The SABS has a, a ballot process which has approved the proposal for a new work item proposal in respect of Eurocode 6, plus the country annexures that go with it. And these are the annexures that, for example, um, in terms of product specification, and in the European Norm Code, it, um, it has a, one of the requirements is for freeze thaw resistance. Now, that's not applicable in South Africa. So, one of the things um, that I'm preparing with a, with a work group is a draft country annexure to EN 771 Part 1 clay masonry to replace SANS 227 specification for burnt clay masonry units. Now, that won't happen unless Eurocode 6 is adopted and then we would move forward to a process of replacing SANS 227 with the country annexure. Thank you, Jim. Thank you.